Welcome everybody. This is the Freedom Side on Breakthrough News and I'm your host Eugene Perrier. We are very happy to have you joining us here on this inaugural episode of the Freedom Side. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with this time more or less maybe an hour later of course at the end of last year we started doing these thursday evening live streams and we wanted to turn it into something that was more permanent not just a reaction to events not just a, a reaction to elections or whatever it may be but a show that is in what we feel is the best tradition of the radical press here in the United States, especially the African-American press as a tribune for working class for, and oppressed people and analysis and news and everything that really fits, not only talking about the problems that exist, how we're actually gonna solve them, how you build movements, what's going on, how does it interact with all the different elements of the world around us, and that's what we are hoping to do every Thursday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on the Freedom Side. Now, of course, Today's show, which we planned well before <laughs> yesterday, uh, we're in a very different context. There's no doubt about that. So as you can imagine, here this evening, we're going to be talking a lot about what we saw uh, really all day yesterday as it concerns the storming of the Capitol by these far right, this far right mob, as it were. We're going to have all sorts of people on today. We've got Dan Cohen here, who's going to come in just a little bit, who was live on the ground there at the Capitol, just giving us a sense of what he saw, what was going on right there. Uh, I'm sure we've seen a lot of it, and he's going to break down some of that for us. We've got Sean Blackman. We've got Dr. Melina Abdullah. We've got Unique Dunstan. We've got Kamal Franklin. We've got Anoah Changa. We're going to be talking about Georgia and what happened there, and how does that relate to everything that's going on? We're going to get even further behind what took place yesterday and what the implications could be going forward and maybe some of the deeper meanings that were there. And we're going to talk about the continued building of movements, even in some of the toughest places, the so-called red states in this country. And all of it, I'm sure, will be very deeply tied in to just everything that we are feeling coming out of yesterday's whatever you want to call it, imbroglio, I guess it would be. So before we get to any of that, take some time right now, hit that share button wherever you may be watching so that whoever follows you can follow us and can also get a taste and eh, more than a little taste of the excellent analysis, commentary and news that we have coming up for you here on the freedom side. So moving just right into it here, uh, there, I mean, there were so many things that happened yesterday, it's hard to explain, but I, 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 it's hard to just, you know, uh, pithily explain, I should say. But what we wanted to do is start with a sense of, of how this thing started, because I think a lot of the way that it played out yesterday, it felt like, oh, well, this sort of escalated out of nowhere. But I think it's important to note that at the rally that was organized by President Trump and a range of other people, I, I should note, uh, including the Republican Attorneys General Association, which got like $100,000 from Amazon last year, $200,000 from Walmart. So they're complicit in this too. But nevertheless, that at this rally, that was the, the front part of it in the early part, uh, the tone was really set for what happened later with some of what I think can only be described as unhinged pieces. So uh, we want to give you a sense of how things started and we're going to get into how they went and what really happened here. But we want to start with a clip from the opening rally uh, of Rudy Giuliani, the president's lawyer, giving um, some marching orders if you will, to the crowd. So, let's have trial by combat. I'm willing to stake, I'm willing to stake my reputation, the president is willing to stake his reputation on the fact that we're going to find criminality there. Well, they certainly didn't find any criminality there, but trial by combat, there certainly was some of that. But uh, there's the president's lawyer right there. They're looking for people, I hear, the FBI, who are complicit in uh, instigating this. Perhaps they should look at the highest levels. Nevertheless, we want to turn to Dan Cohen, a journalist with Behind the Headlines. He was there yesterday. He was on the ground, saw many things that happened. Dan, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks a lot for having me, Eugene. You know, there, I mean, <laughs> there's so many places we could start, I think, and, and you were out there for, for uh, quite some time. We were following your feed yesterday. Maybe my first question for you is, I mean, did it, what did it feel when you first sort of arrived at the Capitol, uh, or were you there before people entered? Did it seem like people kind of came keyed up? Were people instigating it or whatever it may have been in the course of what was going on? What was kind of the scene, if you could, just as you got there and, and were milling about, what did you see? 
I arrived um, sometime after like 1 p.m. after things have already started to get you know pretty heated. Two buildings had been evacuated by that point. Um, and so I just immediately beelined for the steps of the Capitol where um, you know all these this mob had already stormed the building. Um, and so right as I arrived, uh, this crowd came out actually uh, just as the police had shot dead. Um, a Trump supporter, you know, one of the one of the members of this mob, um, a, a woman who, uh, you know, has now been publicly identified. Um, so that was, you know, kind of a shocking scene, because I think a lot of these people expected that they just have total support from the police. Um, and the, the police did give them a lot of support in a, in a lot of ways. Um, there was, you know, kind of this uh, cozy relationship on one hand. On another hand, you saw um, you know some of the some of the mobs shouting at the poli- shouting at the police, cursing them out, saying, "You know, you're the new Antifa. We supported you with your biggest supporters, and now you're doing this." Um, you know, because these basically fascist mobs supported the police when they were you know beating down Black Lives Matter supporters, and you know these protests in Antifa um, all summer long. You know, throughout this uprising that was across the country, and now they were so mad to see that you know they weren't getting total support to just take over the Capitol. Um, but, it, you know, also there's, it has been reported that there were actually police who were sh- showing their badges that were part of the mob um, who were partaking in it. And there were also members, you know, lawmakers from around the country. So a really uh, chaotic kind of anarchic scene, um, you know, and, and, and horrible to, to see someone die. Yeah, I mean, it was really, I mean, watching it unfold here at Breakthrough News, some of it felt so surreal. I, I want to quickly play a clip here that I think speaks to some of what you're saying, and it's raised a lot of questions um, of the police more or less kind of letting people in. And, and so I just want to play this for people who maybe didn't see it um, and, and ask you just a couple other questions kind of flowing from that. Police are squabbling with protesters. Oh, there we go. And they just reached the Capitol again. So that clip, just for people who don't know, or for maybe someone who just tuned in just after we stopped it, the police opening up the bike racks, sort of letting people in. They start to flow at least into the Capitol grounds more specifically. I, I, I mean, how in... What what was the attitude of the police? I mean, it seems that in, in a lot of places they were very nonchalant. Others, there was a little back and forth, pushing and shoving and fighting, pepper spray. I mean, it almost seemed like there wasn't the exact same orientation on either side. Some people seemed all for it, laughing, joking, taking selfies, and others, I don't want to editorialize too much. I mean, what did you see in terms of police behavior there? Yeah, I mean, it was certainly very restrained from police overall. Um, I saw, you know, scenes where people were taking selfies, taking pictures with police. I saw people heckling police, um, you know, Proud Boy types, the, the real kind of, you know, hard right agitators on the ground, really, you know, uh, chastising police. But, you know, I mean, if you compare that to what we saw over the summer, it's such a stark contrast where police were just out in force beating down and arresting in mass everyone they could. Um, I mean, it was hours and hours that people were just basically hanging out on the steps of the Capitol building and had essentially commandeered the area and the police just let it happen. So the police really facilitated this in so many ways. um, And, you know, in that anarchy arose the moment where there was that that basically execution, um, which, you know, I I totally hold the police responsible for. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I I mean, it certainly seemed incongruent. I mean, they facilitated people coming in. They seemed to just be letting people do whatever, trash offices, break windows. One thing that kind of struck me about the video, and, and you posted the video uh, of uh, the woman who was shot, was that like 10 seconds after it seemed, this heavily armed SWAT team emerged. And I just, well, where, what were they doing the whole time? I mean, it seems as if it was they were just milling about doing these things. It's, I mean, did you get the sense that there wasn't communication between the police or, or just, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard to explain. You might not be able to explain it either. The whole thing seemed uh, bizarre. Yeah, I mean, presumably, you know, there's probably some kind of, you know, it doesn't operate as kind of one organism altogether. And there's, there were all kinds of different, um, you know, police forces out there. They had bust in police from Prince George's County, tons of them. There was SWAT, there was Metro Police, there was, uh, uh, you know, Capitol police department. So, 
I, you know, I really doubt that um, there was there was real organization from the top down. Um, but you know, I mean, largely in this in this context of the police facilitating, it's not really surprising that when they let they essentially let people storm the Capitol building, that you know, eventually one of them, you know, it was, it's been reported that it was a member of the Capitol uh, Capitol Police that mm-hmm. that killed this woman. But it's not really surprising to see that. So, you know, the police shouldn't have let people do that. And then that cop should not have um, used lethal force. If you watch the video, as you said, not only were there what appears to be SWAT or heavily armed and heavily, uh, you know, armored police uh, right behind that woman, even actually just as she was shot, but the cop is right there. So it's like she didn't present any kind of threat. And I think we need to be totally consistent that when we condemn you know, state execution, state-sponsored murder of, you know, of, of black people, of Black Lives Matter protesters, of any, any civilians, we have to condemn the police killing uh, uh, even a Trump supporter for no apparent reason. And it's, it's just, you know, really uh, hell should come down on, on the police for this, and, you know, as well as the political class. Yeah, well, and one just news note here for people to know, uh, the head of the Capitol Police now has resigned. I believe the House Sergeant at Arms has resigned. The Senate Sergeant at Arms allegedly is going to be removed if he does not resign, says Chuck Schumer. And, uh, oh my God, what is this guy's name from Ohio? One of the, Tim Ryan, uh, who I guess is the head of whatever the House committee is over the the Capitol Police, is saying they're going to fire a bunch of people. There's now all these investigations that are coming out. So we're going to learn more about this, I think, on all levels. I mean, I, I mean to me, me, Dan, and, 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 you know, taking what you say, taking a step back, it felt to me, and I, and I said this earlier on the punch out, uh, the podcast we have here on Breakthrough News, that, you know, really the police knew for weeks that this was going to be more or less what it was, even though they didn't know exactly they were going to breach the Capitol. And they took such a nonchalant attitude, I would say, because they seem to have had some level of complicity with these people. Certainly we know Capitol Police and others are, are many of them are supporters of Trump. And then you know, they were shocked in a way that I think it was kind of on both sides. I thought that was a good point you made. People were shocked the police weren't necessarily 100% with them. I think the police were shocked that the other side was not 100% with them and maybe figured, oh, well, it'll all be fine. We'll just work it out, you know, kind of amongst friends and it won't be a big deal. And that was that light touch and everything kind of got out of hand from there. But, you know, one other thing I want to ask you too is, about the attendees themselves. I I mean, there's obviously a lot of images. I mean, there's a guy with a Camp Auschwitz hoodie, but then there's also people flying Israeli flags. Uh, There's obviously everyone there is a Trump supporter. I I mean, it it was a motley crew to say the least. The Oath Keepers are there and others. I mean, what what did you take from who was in the crowd? Well, there's no doubt that there were quite a few hardcore fascists that are extremely dangerous um, and, you know, basically part of organized fascist militias. you know, but I think there's also an element of people who are kind of, you know, confused and, and, and left out. And, you know, if, if you watch CNN or MSNBC, you know that it's basically fake. And so, you know, they're looking for or an alternative. I think there is an element of that. Um, and, and so they get into, you know, info wars of these far right conspiracies and they get sucked into kind of, you know, the, the whole kind of Trump mindset. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to kind of separate those elements to some degree and not say every single person there is, you know, a Nazi who's, you know, a a total threat to society. But, um, you know, I think it's really just symptomatic of, of, you know, the major disease that we have in this society where, you know, we have billionaire oligarch owned media um, and, you know, people have really, you know, uh, hard lives and very little going for them. And so, you know, that's where the energy gets redirected instead of something, you know, seeing something counter, t- totally counter revolutionary is so frustrating because, you know, you see how the left um, is basically in this country so tied to the Democratic Party. And, you know, the major political figures are, uh, have all basically sheepdog for the Democratic Party. Why can't we have a, you know, a left wing movement that's saying, you know what, $600 is not enough, Nancy Pelosi. That's insulting that you would say that. You know, we need health care. We need, you know, guaranteed income. Uh, we need guaranteed housing. Let's go storm the Senate and, sh- and say what this is really about. But, and, but, you know, the left is just not that organized, is way too meager in this country. And so, you know, the right has showed that, it, that it's significantly more powerful. So it's really, you know, a revealing moment. No, I think it's a very revealing moment. I think you make a very good point. I mean, when it seems like 
the only sort of outside of the mainstream oppositional politics is this far right insanity. Uh, it has the ability to create illusions, I think, in, in what it really is uh, and, and what it really is, is bringing. And I think that's you know incredibly important to recognize that this is a building movement. Not everyone is fully formed, but if it isn't countered, it'll continue to grow and it'll continue to push forward. You know, my final question for you, Dan, in terms of just, just being out there and sort of seeing different pieces is, I mean, did you get a sense when you were there that when, or, or maybe let me put it to you like this, did you get a sense when people were sort of coming in, coming out, doing these different things that it, what, did it feel like the start of something? Like, did you feel like people were excited or whatever, or in the chaos where there are multiple different things. I think that's just something a lot of people are wondering and people are asking sort of, what's next? Will they continue to protest? Will it fade and all these different pieces? You know, there's a lot of real genuine anger. Um, you know, that's undeniable. I mean, people are caught up in, you know, conspiracy theory. I mean, there's no evidence that I've seen of, you know, that, this, that the vote was, that was rigged against Trump. Um, but, you know, they genuinely believe it and they really think that their country was basically stolen from them. And I don't think they're just going to disappear. I mean, this is a dangerous moment. Um, and, you know, I don't uh, is a real reckoning yesterday, but it's going to continue. I don't know how. I have no idea. I hate to speculate, but, mm -hmm. I, you know, this is not going away. And. You know, uh, I think, you know, we on the left need to be able to address this and offer an alternative to this totally reactionary, extreme right wing shift and, you know, the total failure of the neoliberal political class to, you know, uh, to offer any alternative to, you know, to, to, to the far right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Dan, I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your impressions of what took place there yesterday. And we'll, uh, we'll all be on this roller coaster together, I guess. But thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Eugene. Absolutely. Well, we are here on the Freedom Side on Breakthrough News. If you hadn't had a chance yet, if you just joined, take the opportunity to hit this share button so everyone that follows you can follow us because this show is going to keep moving on. The movement will keep moving on, as I often like to say, with some fantastic guests to help us get a little bit further uh, just into what's going on and what should be next. Very, very honored to be joined here by Dr. Melina Abdullah, who is a lead organizer with Black Lives Matter LA and also a professor of Pan African Studies at Cal State LA and the Sean Blackman, host of By Any Means Necessary, my comrade and former colleague. Thank you both so much for being with us. Exactly. Thank you for having me. No, the pleasure is really all ours. Uh, 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 doctor, I'll start with you. I mean, <laughs> when we... What we saw yesterday, there's a lot there. Uh, you know, there's there's many things that could be taken, but I, I guess I just wonder, what were your first thoughts seeing what was happening in Washington yesterday? Um, I think I was appalled. I was outraged. Um, it was not shocking, um, but it was a stark reminder of how white supremacy works in this country. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, it's an extraordinarily important point because I think, and, and one of the things I want to, is you, oh, did we lose you there, Dr. Abdullah? Can you hear us? You didn't lose me. This is part of uh, the new technology of doing things at home <laughs> that you have to answer the front door while you're doing a uh, doing a uh, broadcast. Well, your ability to multitask is absolutely uh, deeply appreciated here, and, and, and I appreciate your first comments. And, and I guess my the, the next question I wanted to ask you, and then I'll pose something similar to you, Sean, is it seems like. <laughs> Uh, it's almost surprising in a way how surprised people are, uh, Dr. Abdullah, because there is such a long history of this type of behavior, yet all we heard last night in Congress was, this is not America, this is not America, this is not who we are. How do you respond to that? This is absolutely America. America is based on white supremacy. It was built on white supremacy. Every single institution and system within this country is a white supremacist system. And so this is absolutely America. Now, it might not be the America that we want it to be. We might um, have wished and hoped that it would be something different, but every single black person in this country 
um, knows that this is what America is to us and has been to us. America is built on the stolen land of indigenous people and the stolen labor of African people. That means that white supremacy is the bedrock of this country. So we find ourselves at a crossroads. Are we going to um, allow for a white supremacist America as we move forward, um, even if it comes in gentler and kinder forms under a Biden-Harris administration? Or are we going to dismantle and end white supremacy? And that requires a fundamental reimagining. That requires an abolitionist approach where we upend unjust systems and usher in new ones. Well, you know, Sean Blackman, I'm also curious your thoughts about those same issues, this whole this is not America. But also I'm hoping, you know, you're there in the District of Columbia. Uh, you know, you've protested many times and dealt with all the police agencies. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the differences in what you saw yesterday and what especially black communities and, and progressive people are, are dealing with vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis, well, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, I tend to agree with Dr. Abdullah. I mean, for me, I feel like what we saw yesterday with this, uh, you know, fascist insurrection here in D.C., I'm not sure what else to call it. It was almost like watching 500 years sort of explode all at once uh, uh, in, in, in a, a moment. And, you know, it, it, I think it says a lot about folks' consciousness when they get into this thing about, well, this is not America and this is, quote unquote, who, not who we are. I'm not sure who this, this we is uh, that they're, they're speaking about. I mean, you know, uh, not only is uh, that the storming of the Capitol very American, I mean, it's as American as Donald Trump, who I've maintained for a while is a very honest expression perhaps one of the most honest expressions of uh, the ugliness uh, of Americanism and to treat either him as an individual or the movement that has coalesced around him as some kind of aberration uh, instead of, you know, illustrative of centuries of white supremacy and capitalist exploitation, I think is to, you know, either be uh, delusional or outright dishonest. And it's true. I don't think people outside of Washington, D.C., are really aware of the fact of how heavily policed DC is. I mean, there are tens, 20, 30 some odd police agencies uh, that are, you know, in power here in DC carrying out, you know, racist terror against black and oppressed communities here in uh, the nation's capital. And we've had our own issues here with, uh, uh, you know, possible white supremacist imagery and other things and associations within the DC police department in the so-called progressive city. And so, you know, uh, what we saw yesterday, I think at the Capitol, I think is very indicative of trends from the local uh, to the national, even the international level. You know, I think that's a very good point. I, I want to play a clip here because I, I, that's partially why I asked you the question about the role of the police, because that's obviously become a big issue in the context of this. And now even Mitch McConnell says they're going to investigate it. But I think there are a lot of questions about the sort of official narrative, which was like, oh, we weren't ready. So I want to play a clip here of, of Cory Bush, Congresswoman Cory Bush from St. Louis, who was asked this same question by Nicole Wallace uh, on MSNBC and her response having been there in the Capitol. You know, there are uh, I guess my question to you is, what do you think happened today? Do you think that Capitol Police were simply overwhelmed? Or do you, because every member that we've spoken to feared for his or her life um, as early as yesterday. So they had to have known that today was possible. Yeah, it's strange because, you know, as someone who has been to hundreds of protests, you know, um, starting back um, from Ferguson, from the Ferguson uprising, it was strange because it was almost like there was this call to not use force. You know, something was, it's just, I'm not used to seeing this where there could be this many people and there is nothing in, that looks like it's in place. Again, that's Congresswoman Cory Bush coming from St. Louis. Dr. Abdullah, I, I mean, I think this is, you know, there's one narrative. Oh, well, the police somehow just weren't ready. I think what Congresswoman Bush is, is raising and what others are asking is, does it seem like the police were complicit? And, and is that strange? 
It doesn't seem like the police were complicit. The police were complicit. The police participated in this attempted coup on the U.S. Capitol. The police moved barriers for white supremacist terrorists. The police helped white supremacist terrorists make it down the steps. They took selfies with them, right? So I think it was telling. It wasn't shocking. It was telling. And um, I think that we need to remember um, who police are, whose side they stand on, and not be shocked. Of course, we're, um, you know, Congresswoman. Bush, along with Congresswoman Omar and a few others, Congresswoman Waters, um, I think are some of the um, most courageous truth tellers that we have and some of the only um, folks who are in uh, at the Capitol in an official capacity who've been willing to tell the truth, who've been willing to say, you know, the system of policing is not the system of policing that black people experience. Um, and had the demonstrators, uh, and I shouldn't call them that, had the people who stormed the Capitol building had been black, if they'd been black, we all know there'd be a massive body count. And so what we're calling for is not police brutality and police violence um, against folks. What we're saying is if they could be this restrained when white supremacist terrorists are actually attempting a coup, then we don't want to hear another word about why police had to shoot and kill a 16-year-old A.J. Weber, why they had to murder uh, my 14-year-old cousin, Andrew Joseph III, why um, they had to steal the life of Waukesha Wilson here in Los Angeles, or Dijon Kizzee, or Freddie Gray, or George Floyd, or Breonna Taylor. We don't want to hear that not another time. They may never utter those words again if they can allow white supremacist terrorists to attempt a coup and be that restrained. Mm -hmm. No, I, the point's very well taken. And, and doctor, I know you have to leave in just a few minutes. So I also want to ask you this, looking forward, now that the Democrats are controlling the House, controlling the Senate, they're in the White House, I, I mean, is this, is, is this a make or break moment for them in terms of, you know, doing what they say they're going to do in terms of addressing the issues of police violence and other issues of, of, of uh, uh, concern to the black community? Absolutely. And we have to remember that this is a moment of transformation. It calls for transformation, not reform of unjust systems. So we want to make sure that Congress takes a look at the BREATHE Act that was authored by the Movement for Black Lives. We want to fundamentally transform oppressive systems in this country. We also know that the Democratic Party has to be pushed. And so we cannot um, vote Donald Trump out, hope that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will take the White House and lead us into freedom. We know that freedom comes when we fight for it. And so this is also a call on us to engage fully in the demand for transformation and that those who won because of the black vote, and we want to be very clear that it's not just about what party you're a part of, right? That we wouldn't have had these Senate wins without black voters, without black organizers, that they won because of us and we demand something for our vote. No, I, I think those are very good points. Dr. Melina Abdullah, lead organizer with Black Lives Matter LA, also <laughs> professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. Honestly, it was it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. No, absolutely. Sean Blackman, I want to ask you sort of a similar question. I mean, you know, you, well, you are the host of By Any Means Necessary. You're a journalist. You're also a, an activist, an organizer. Uh, you've been working on these issues, uh, you know, for some time now. What are you sort of just sitting with after yesterday in terms of, of where the movement for black lives, the movement for transformative change, whatever we want to call it. I, I mean, wh what needs to happen next? I, I know that's a big question. It's a loaded question, but uh, at least some of your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is a big question. And I really kind of I would root my answer in really the response from uh, the political mainstream that we've seen. You mentioned mm -hmm. Representative Tim Ryan earlier, who's 
uh, the chairperson of the, uh, I believe it's the Legislative Branch Appropriations Committee who oversees the Capitol of Police. And do you know, he did an article with Vox today that said that they did not anticipate violence <laughs> with the, uh, with the, they didn't anticipate, with a group that is violent, every single time that they come to DC, they stabbed people last time they Thank were you. here. Ripped Black Lives Matter signs down from black churches, set it on fire. Enrique Terrio, the leader of the Proud Boys, got arrested right when he got to D.C. because of all this. But they didn't know that they was going to be violent. OK. And what is Joe Biden talking about? Joe Biden is trying to is obviously making some kind of uh, pandering appeal. Uh, he would almost sound like something you hear on Breakthrough News or by any means necessary, pointing out, um, you know, about how Black Lives Matter protesters have and would have been treated different in a similar situation. Well, that's correct, but this is Joe Biden, uh, one of the architects of uh, the mass incarceration state, Mr. Crime Bill, Mr. Uh, Plan Columbia, which some have said is a Latin American analog to the crime bill, mm. uh, Mr. Champion of the Iraq War, uh, the same cat who not only has a self-proclaimed top cop as his uh, vice president, who has completely rejected the notion of defunding the police and said that he wants to give the police more money Joe Biden loves militarized policing, okay? Come on. So it's a cruel joke uh, to think that there's going to be some sort of substantive change about policing under Joe Biden when he has told us in very plain terms that he will not. So what that means in terms of the movement, the movement against racist police terror, the movement against uh, white supremacy in this country is that we must begin, as we see these far right fascist leaning elements mm -hmm. continue to organize continue to build and continue to do the best they can to uh, uh be in some kind of uh, power we must develop a mass movement outside of the democratic party in my opinion uh to really sort of address this and this and i actually want to uh, address something that i've been Please. seeing particularly on social media this notion that uh, what happened yesterday at the Capitol is, quote unquote, uh, a white folks business. Mm -hmm. I think we should be very clear about something. This Trumpist demonstration was a demonstration of people who hold every possible reactionary tendency. White supremacy, misogyny, anti-immigrant xenophobia, anti-LGBTQ bigotry, anti-Semitism, all of that. And they want all of us dead, frankly. And so we, we can't fool ourselves into thinking that we are, you know, somehow have no part or have no implication on us with that. And so I think we have to get real about uh, what's happening in this country, because both that uh, that fascist movement, Donald Trump himself and uh, Joe Biden and the incoming Democratic administration all are sworn to protect this white supremacist capitalist system. And as such, we must develop this uh, movement across all kinds of different lives to overturn that very system. No, I, I think that's an extraordinary point. I'm glad you brought up uh, Enrique Tarico, Tarico, whatever his name is from the Proud Boys, arrested with two high capacity magazines. And as you know very well, Sean, as someone who lives in Southeast DC, I, I mean, and they let him leave. They let they just let him go. I mean, I guess he has to come back for a trial. If, if you're black in Southeast DC and you have get caught with a high capacity magazine, they put you under the jail. So the level right. of, of double standards that are at play is so huge. Sean Blackman, host of By Any Means Necessary, once again, you, you know, you've been very generous with your time with us here on Breakthrough. Really happy to have you join us. It was my pleasure, Eugene. Oh, the pleasure was all ours. We're going to keep moving forward here. We've got more going on. There's so much going on. I, it's, you know, where do you even start? We only have an hour here. We have to keep it moving. But just a reminder for you to share this live stream. We're still going, we still got more guests, we got more to talk about. So hit that share button right now, let everyone who's following you follow us. You can also go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news if you'd like and become a patron. We are crowdfunded, we are supported by you. If you like what you're hearing, you wanna hear more of it, you wanna see us expand what we do, patreon.com slash breakthrough news and you can become a patron, you can donate, you can help us do more, reach more, talk to more people. Uh, we're a community here. It's not just us talking at you. So patreon.com slash breakthrough news. We're going to keep moving here. We want to turn the page a little bit to a little bit south of Washington, D.C. to Georgia. Obviously, these issues are not unconnected in any way, shape or form. So a lot to get into here. Very, very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Noah Changa, who's an Atlanta based journalist.
I've uh, done a lot of organizing, hosted a podcast, someone who I have really just been, uh, had the privilege to know over the past few years on a range of things. And also very happy to be joined here by Kamal Franklin, who's an organizer with Community Movement Builders and a co-host of the podcast, fantastic podcast, I have to say, Renegade Culture. Thank you both so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. No, the pleasure is all ours. Uh, Anoa, I'm going to start with you here. Um, you know, <laughs> where do you even start? Obviously, when we conceived of this and wanted you to come on, nothing had happened yesterday, and we were just thinking about elections, and so much has happened. But I, I don't think the two things are disconnected, um, uh, you know, w at all, really, and that there's a lot to say. Um, but sort of sticking with what we saw on Tuesday in the election, I mean, give us some sense uh, from your point of view about what it was that powered this Democratic win. I think a lot of people are asking the who, what, where, when, and why of how Georgia, a state that everyone views as, uh, not everyone, people in New York City, Charlottesville, Virginia, like where I'm from, the negative things they'll say about Georgia. People are saying, how did this happen? You've been on the ground, you've been dealing with this uh, you know, for some time now, give us a sense. Oh, no, you might be muted. Yes, I am. Hi, y'all. I am catching up on sleep. Um, one, thank you for having me. And then two, yeah, so what powered this Democratic win? I mean, yeah, I guess it's their win, but it's really, I think, a people's win. You have a lot of folks who wanted to show the proof of concept of the way they organize and build. And so this was an opportunity in not just this general election cycle, but really in this eight week runoff period for a lot of different organizations around the state to really put into action what they've been talking about in terms of how they can build multiracial coalitions that are not predicated upon um, you know the traditional way Democrats run their races so the candidates and the campaigns did what they did uh, but you saw organizations like the New Georgia Project like uh, you know Mahente Asian Americans Advancing Justice um, so many different organizations around the state just really digging in deep and you know folks may see you know the big buses with Black Voters Matter and the work that Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright do but you know may not understand like the groundwork they have been laying uh, along with other folks down in middle Georgia and southwest Georgia really digging in and supporting the work of local rural organizers so that they have the capacity to not just, you know, help turn out voters for this election cycle, but whether or not they're staffing and supporting people doing voter uh, 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 engagement work or voter protection work at the polling locations, not just in this major election cycle, but then year round when there are local elections and municipal elections are coming up this year. So it's going to be really interesting to see how people are able to maintain their infrastructure uh, for what's to come. No, I, I think those are very good points. And, and, you know, Kamal, one thing I think that people and just sort of trying to put these two things together a little bit here were th I, I think thinking in the wake of what we saw yesterday at the Capitol is these people seem very organized. Obviously, they have a lot of support inside of the, the security establishment, the state, the police. Uh, how can we really counter this? I mean, I think it, and to speak to Anoa's point, sort of the Democrats not only claiming everything about why the win happened, but sort of also setting themselves up as like, we are the counterpoint to this fascist movement. You don't have that much to worry about. This was kind of a sideshow come January 20th. It's all gonna be fine. And I'm just curious your thoughts about, maybe even reflecting on what we saw in Georgia, and, and you're also based there in Atlanta, and, and the type of movement that needs to come you know, in the wake of everything we've seen in the past few days to really counter what I think, I think many of us knew it was a threat, but I think many people are waking up to maybe at a larger level than they had thought. Well, you know, when I think about what type of movement is needed, it's really about how do we organize uh, institutions, grassroots organizations that get everyday people involved in building resources to take over their lives. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I'm one of those folks who obviously you know, I, I don't depend on the Democratic Party or their institutions uh, to do anything that's going to be liberatory for black people. Uh, I think the Democratic Party is is part of uh, of a fascist state. It's just the lighter end of that fascist state. It's a capitalist state uh, apparatus. And I think it operates as such. It needs the black vote at this particular point to win elections. And so it will do what it can to secure that vote. But whether or not the Democratic Party is at all interested in a sort of a liberation uh, uh, policy apparatus that gives black people resources and 
and help support self-determination? I think obviously the definite answer is no. So I think people have to continue to treat the Democratic Party as a short-term device to win some policy changes, um, to get some of the boots off of our neck. But I think the long-term sort of uh, fight is really around whether or not we as a people will be able to organize our, organize ourselves into organizations uh, that's going to fight for our self-determination. And I think one thing that the right wing has been doing successfully, both within the Republican Party and outside. So, in fact, they're doing it so well, the Republican Party is trying to catch up to what the right wing has been doing a lot of times is that they organize on a grassroots level with working class people, whether or not I agree with their ideas, whether or not I think they're silly for what they're doing. Uh, I obviously think they're dangerous in what they do, uh, but they are able to organize mass constituents. And I think, you know, it's up to folks like me and others who, who preach this uh, to be able to get on the ground and organize people uh, to develop organizations outside of the Democratic Party which truly really speak truth to power. You know, I, I think that's a very good point, and, and I actually want to get both of your thoughts on this next question. I'll go to you uh, as well, and Noah, because I think it speaks, uh, you know, the issue of people's consciousness, I think, is so crucially important. And I think that oftentimes there is a feeling, and, and I certainly understand it myself, I've been an organizer for some times, of sort of the people's consciousness not really being ready or whatever it may be. But, I, I mean, one of the things that I at least took away from the uh, Georgia piece, I mean, Obviously, Ossoff ran before right and lost. Uh, I am just sort of guessing in general here that there's probably not a lot of people who had a lot of hopes in Joe Biden. And, you know, whether or not I would agree with every element of where people were coming from, it does seem like there was some element of this that was people thinking independently, like my action, the actions of our community can make a difference and can make a change. And I think, you know, regardless of what the Democrats are bringing to the table and regardless of what they will do, that seems like an important seed. Uh, to continue to water and to germinate, uh, certainly everywhere, but at least there uh, in, in what we've seen in both urban and rural Georgia. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is correct. And when you were talking about like people's consciousness and just shifting like what's possible, like getting to what Kamal's talking about too, like. I think we have to not allow the limitations that traditional political apparatus put upon us in the way we're thinking about imagining and envisioning how we act and how we build and what we do. Um, we may not all agree exactly on what it looks like in the day to day, how we get there. But I do think like having these conversations in community, uh, providing, uh, and, you know, Kamau can talk about the work that they actually do, but like, you know, making sure people are actually feeling like I'm giving my time to something so it's worthwhile or my needs are at least being partially met in what I'm doing, right? You know, just demanding that people show up and have a conversation or show up and cast a ballot and then that's it. And we talk to you again in four years. I mean, that's how, you know, so many people decide to check out and not participate in this process. Uh, definitely understand where some folks come from when they're like, I don't see a point in participating in the process, but at least organizers, you know, who, who see themselves in engaging in electoral politics need to be making the case to people, not just six weeks out before election or GOTV weekend or whatever, but having that long-term investment in like, how do we move from not just point A to this next election, but what does it look like long-term to start organizing and building collective and collaboratively? So like, I know these are conversations that I've had with both of you independently, but we need simultaneous organizing because unfortunately we still do exist in this system and there are decisions that are still being made and I don't think that we can just completely remove ourselves from that decision making process at the same time we should be clear on terms of how we're setting our agendas how we're moving things we should not just see ourselves as a cog in the democratic apparatus or wheel um like I'm in favor of using you know that as a party line ballot access but that takes building your own apparatus your own internal your own machine to make sure that you can insulate to the best of your ability and protect your folks as they're going into these different systems so as we're looking at here in Atlanta you know we talked about what's happened you know folks have been talking about what happened in DC but here in Georgia in the state capital we had our militia folks that have been reported walking through the capital searching for the Secretary of State and you and I both know where we come from if folks are walking around with armed looking for somebody it's not to have a conversation none of those people you know were nothing has happened to any of those folks however just nearby we also had a, a, a visual solidarity event going on and 23 people arrested um in a jacob blake solidarity event for you know what has happened in kenosha so we have this disparity happening right now with the atlanta city council and people pushing so yes you know folks electorally are like we need to strategically move and get different people in these seats but at the same time there's still the pressure points that need to 
happen in terms of organizing and how uh, the city and other institutions are engaging for our communities. And that balance and that tension at the same time is something that we need to be talking to folks very transparently and honestly about and navigating and not just being key keying because my, my, key, my mayor is black and her name is Keisha. Hmm. Uh, my mayor is black and she, her name is Keisha and um, she's also part of the problem, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Well, as Kwame Turia said, revolutionaries, we always look for difficulties. So I, I think trying to figure out how to hold that tension is important. And, and, and Kamau, I, I want to turn really the same question to you uh, and, and just plug again community movement builders. I mean, you guys are doing great organizing there on the ground. Uh, and, and certainly, please talk about that if you could. But also some of just your similar thoughts maybe on this issue of, uh, of are we seeing sort of a, a rise in consciousness and something, a, a seed that we can water and grow? Yeah, I mean, I think Anoa had it exactly correct that there's uh, there are certain things that you do within the movement that allows you to do uh, party politics, but also allows you to understand that you must organize your base so that they're doing far more than putting all of their time into thinking that voting for a moderate and or so-called liberal candidate who subscribes to particular party politics of pro-capitalism and pro-developer um, and supporting sort of uh, uh, rich people over poor people and working class people, uh, we have to figure out which way to go forward so that we're not stuck into that mode all the time. You know, I think one thing that has always been correct is that uh, within black cities or majority black cities, we have had democratic administrations who have led these cities. cities and when we think about Atlanta, we've had black mayorships, um, for the last 45 years. We've had uh, majority black city councils for the last 45 years. And when you look at the city of Atlanta, it has suffered uh, from gentrification of a vast majority of black community that's gone from 60% to barely 50%. The poverty rates for black folks are still like uh, almost double that of white folks. Uh, the, the wages are lower and so forth and so on, healthcare. So there's nothing under these liberal democratic administrations that point to a which way forward for a larger black community. So that's why organizers on the ground always got to say, hey, we got to step up and, and show people that we can develop alternative economic systems like cooperatives that we do in community movement builders, do grassroots organizing. We do uh, cop watches and security patrols around police brutality uh, and do grassroots organizing around the issues of gentrification um, and other things. So we have to constantly be on the ground and develop these actions so that we can have a base of support to challenge both Republican and Democratic Party officials because our liberation is not going to be voted, right? Our liberation is going to be won because we take it. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the peace, if you're willing to fight for it, I, I agree with that 100 percent. I, I think it's, it's it's a crucial thing to recognize as well that, you know, it's always said without struggle, there is no progress. But I think, you know, dare to struggle, dare to win. It's said in many different ways, but I think it is one of those things that uh, when I was looking at what was happening in Washington yesterday, it was I was sort of struck by is in, in just people's commentary on it. Um, and certainly the way I think a lot of mainstream politicians push it is almost like we are objects to be acted on, not subjects in history. And it's like, look at all these terrible mm -hmm. things these white supremacists are doing. Oh, it's so scary. Who knows what's going to happen? As if we can't do something to push back. And that seems to me to be a, a, a very dangerous type of mentality, certainly a demobilizing mentality uh, in terms of, of, of what we see. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just ask you this. Uh, this is maybe the most controversial question, and I'll go out on it. Uh, <laughs> A lot of people looking at Georgia, obviously the first black senator from Georgia is, is a big deal. I mean, there's no doubt about that. A state founded to have no black people in it. Reverend Raphael Warnock is Martin Luther King's church. You know, I was a little disappointed to see some of his positioning on a number of issues, but I, I look, I'm not there. But predictions, uh, uh, Kamal, I'll start with you. Kanoa and I know I'll end on you. Are you expecting anything in particular? I think a lot of people are looking at obviously what's a big first and thinking, oh, this is going to be big. Is it going to be more run-of-the-mill Kamau, or are you expecting him to potentially be a change agent? Uh, I expect more run-of-the-mill. I mean, I, I think, you know, we should be past the point of thinking that just because we have politicians that look like us, they're going to act in our behalf, or because we have folks who speak a certain line, as soon as the pressure is put on by their party, as we've already seen, um, and this includes uh, Reverend Warnock, some of the positions he's taken, uh, that he switched on, and particularly look at Israel, some of his positions in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the struggle around Palestinian self-determination, some of his uh, sort of backtracking on police issues. I think what we have here is uh, is 
a case of the Democrats have controlled Congress uh, in different time periods before. They've controlled both Congress, the presidency, and uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court. It's not like those things lead to liberation for working class people and or for black people. So I think obviously there's pressure to be put. There's probably more avenues for pressure. But again, if we put too much of our energy and time into thinking that the Democratic Party is going to do anything more than what they've done for us, then we're just repeating a strategy that makes us crazy. And, and you know, in terms of what the saying goes, we need to be out in these streets organizing our folks. And that's how we're really gonna bring change to our communities. Mm-hmm. Anoa Chenga, your thoughts. Oh, you might be muted again, Anoa. That's cool. Don't worry about it. It's all good. We're relaxed. It's nighttime. It's live. You know, We're when you got a puppy and kids <laughs> who don't necessarily respect the recording schedule, like, <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, I agree with Kamau in terms of the pressure and the ways in which people think that they have to bend on particular issues to get into certain positions, particularly when you're thinking about something like a Senate race versus even just the House going into the House of Representatives. Um, I do think that there are some things that we'll see change that should be expected um, in terms of just some things moving forward, like the voting rights admitted uh, with the VRAA, uh, Voter Rights Advancement Act, um, possibly even the Moore Act, which is proposes to decriminalize uh, marijuana at the federal level and potentially could open up, you know, more for at the state level. Um, but, you know, beyond these like procedural things that could happen that may provide uh, entry points for organizing. I mean, I think that's all they could potentially be, right? Or entry points for organizing and advocacy. I mean, no matter what happens legislatively in the Senate, um, we're still going to have to do all the groundwork that we're doing. And, and, and things like what Kamal was talking about in terms of having community cooperatives and things of that nature are things that we need to start talking more with folks about regularly so that folks can understand how that even works. What does that look like? I think people like the idea of alternatives, but maybe can't envision them themselves. So we need to help share that guided imagery and and, and help move folks along, even as, you know, for those of us who do do electoral work are engaging with uh, these candidates and systems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, Anoa Chenga, Kamal Franklin, really appreciate y'all. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thanks for having us. Well, of course, pleasure is all mine. We may even have you again. I'd certainly be honored to if you'd be willing to come back. (laughs) I don't know. Atlanta Papers might write another article about us. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) But you came out on the other side stronger, and that's what's important. I'll tell you, anytime I see that guy Greg Blaustein's uh, byline, I just... That's a little inside joke between us there, but we'll we'll get we'll have a whole story on uh, the so-called Russian infiltration one day. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. See you soon. Have a great rest of your evening. We're going to keep moving forward here. We are very, very happy to be joined as we move forward here by Unique Dunstan, who is the founder of Reclaiming Our Time, which has been protesting in Albertville, Alabama since the summer. Unique, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'll tell you, I'm really excited. I I think I, like a lot of people, saw the article, the AP piece about what you all were doing with Reclaiming Our Time in Albertville, and it would just struck me. And obviously, it was before everything we saw yesterday. But I mean, just reading about what you all are doing, the, the protesting at the Confederate statue, then to see these people with these Confederate flags in the Capitol yesterday. I, I mean, I just wonder how you're feeling. Uh, I, I just, I'll just leave it there. Well, I've, I've seen so many Confederate flags in person since we started this campaign to get this rebel flag and Confederate monument gone. It's almost to a point where it's normal to me, which is horrible to say and realize. And just saying it out loud is like, it's crazy. But our counter protesters in Albertville, Alabama are what you or what we witnessed. The the crazy, out of hand, saying anything, that's what we experience in Albertville, Alabama, obviously on a much smaller scale. But yeah, I we're we're looking at white supremacists every time we go out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in a way, you're sort of in the heartland of a lot of these people who probably supported what happened yesterday. And and, and that's what I really wanted to get to. I mean, I, I you know, 
just to quickly, I don't want to tell your story for you, but for maybe people who didn't read uh, uh, the article or see the piece, you know, you are from Albertville, small town, mostly white area. You go to Mobile, uh, shout out to all my people in Mobile, which I think is like 50% black, uh, is, love that place. And, but then you come back to Albertville and you start waging this struggle. I think there's probably a lot of people who think, why go back? Why deal with this? Just, why don't just leave those people there and, and, and live your life? It was a feeling that I had inside that was just like, if not me, then who? Mm. Literally. Nobody else is going to do this work in Albertville. And so I just went back and just did it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> thank God everything, we, we've been protected as far as nobody being hurt. I have been assaulted, but I was not hurt. Mm. But, oh, man. And yeah. it's it's way, way more than I thought it would be, harder than I thought it would be. I mean, I, I grew up with these people and to have to see some of my old teachers like speak out against me and like, <laughs> it's been wild. It's been wild. I, believe me, I, I can imagine, but I, I, you know, I think it's important and in a way, I feel obviously everyone isn't living in, in Albertville, of course, but I think a lot of like what you did to come back to your hometown to, and to start waging this struggle and to organize who you could to do it. I think a lot of people look at what's going on and they say, I'd like to do something, but you know, they feel like they can't, you know, I mean, it feels like there's, there's nothing. That, well, maybe just take that back. I think you understand what I'm saying. What's your message to people like that? Because I think there's so many folks who want to take action, but feel fear, feel confused or whatever it may be. And I, I think your story is a great example of how, you know, it, we all can do it. I think my advice is to don't try to reinvent the wheel. Here, I mean, look to your leaders in your city. And if you don't have any black leaders in your city, like I didn't, I had to look outside of my city. So what's outside of Albertville? Birmingham, mm. Montgomery, <laughs> Mobile. So although in the small county of Marshall County, I did not have that strong leadership that I needed, I could look outside of the county um, and get that leadership that I needed. Uh, also extra support. Um, there are, at this moment, there are a lot of people in the in the county and the city that support us, but don't really come out to protest with us. Whereas you have people that will come from the neighboring um, county, the neighboring city from Albertville to come and support us. So I think, it's okay to look outside of of the area that you're in for, for help and support. And I think you'll be surprised of what kind of help and support that you get. And it may not come immediately, but just keep going, keep pressing. Um, you know, if, if you are a spiritual person, whatever you do to get you into that space where you feel motivated and determined, get there and do it. And the time is now. I'm telling you all, the time is now. No, I, I, well, I appreciate that 100%. I, I think if everything we've seen this week, that's, that's crystal clear. And, and the other element of that that I also wanted to ask you about is you're in Alabama. I think there are many people who would say, not just Albertville, but Alabama in general, Mississippi, South Carolina, is there hope there? Can things change? I mean, I'm assuming you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't believe that things can change. But talk about that a little bit, because I think this sort of red state, blue state, what's possible divide also kind of holds us back a little bit. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think what we see in black communities all across America is this sense of hopelessness um, with our environments um, politically in our communities. And in the South, that hopelessness is strong and it's very hard to fight off uh, because you feel defeated already. Like before you even make a plan, it's just like, it's Alabama. And the worst of the worst news can come out about Alabama and our response is, I'm not surprised. 
And so I want to get rid of that to where we're not so numb to these white supremacists coming in and getting to honor their heritage and forget about ours. Mm. So that is really my message in doing this, that there is hope in Alabama. There is hope in your small town, wherever you are. Um, And the change starts with you. It, It starts with you. I really appreciate those points. And and just before we close here, uh, just reclaiming our time, you I believe you all are doing a weekly protest, right? Uh, Talk a little bit about what you some of what you're doing. And also if there's a way people can support you, find you and help you, because I'm sure a lot of people seeing this now are thinking, what can I do? Yes. So community members from Marshall County started the petition back in June. And I joined the campaign. I like to call it a campaign because that's kind of how we're having to run it. Um, I joined in August when our first protest was and we started going to the county commission meetings and eventually the city council meetings. But um, yeah, reclaiming our time got in there and, and we've done the necessary work with starting the petition and sharing it and now getting national news, which is amazing and and greatly appreciated. So um, the petition can be found on our Facebook page, uh, Reclaiming Our Time. Also my personal Facebook page, Unique Morgan Dunstan. Um, You'll definitely be able to find it there. I try to share it as as often as possible. But yeah, that is is how it's going in, in Alabama and specifically in Albertville. One other thing I would like to mention about Alabama, we are fighting against Governor um, Kay Ivey Mm. because she has proposed three new mega prisons to be built, which will cost us over $2 to build. And the Department of Justice has already said that Alabama literally has the worst prisons. So... We, we are fighting against that. We are saying no new prisons. We are calling for reform in Alabama, and we're, we're hopeful here, but we can do this. Right on. Well, I, I am also hopeful. I think how it's going, it sounds like it's going quite well. I, I was so pleased to see the article in the AP and to see this is going on in Albertville. And shout out to all my people in Mobile, Birmingham, Talladega. I know it's a lot of folks, Talladega, well, look at me. Uh, you know, a lot of people who are working hard and doing a lot. And I think, thank you for lifting up that prison issue. Huge, huge, huge issue. But unique, Morgan, Dunstan, Thank you so much for being with us. It was really an honor to have you. Thank you so much. And before I go, I have to give a quick shout out to the Alabama Justice Initiative, to the SPLC, to the uh, ACLU of Alabama, Project Say Something, BLM. Thank you guys so much for the support that you give me. And I hope that you feel the same um, support that I give to you all. We can do this, y'all. We got this. Right on. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us, Unique, all here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Of course. Well, that is going to do it more or less for us here on the Freedom Side uh, here today. Obviously, for uh, by the way, just in case you missed that and you just tuned in, that was Unique Dunstan from Reclaiming Our Time based in Albertville, Alabama. They're leading a fantastic struggle there against this ridiculous uh, Confederate imagery i guess it's absurd nevertheless uh anyway fantastic definitely please check that out but that is going to do it for us here on the freedom side for this week we are going to be with you every week on thursdays 8 p.m eastern standard time we're going to have fantastic guests fantastic analysis all sorts of just everything you could imagine that's good that's what's going to be happening on this show like i said at the beginning we really want this to be in the best tradition of the radical press of the african-american press as a tribune for the people in this country working class and oppressed people what people need what's really going on what they can do how we can build movements how we can fight back how we can change things all of that is going to be happening here 
here on the freedom side. And like I also said, and before I leave you, we are 100% crowdfunded here. We need your support to be able to do all these great things, to bring in all these great guests, to be able to do even more, have even more shows. And we're going to have some news about that next week at 8 p.m. So definitely make sure you're here. We're going to have a great show for you, but also a great preview of some fantastic new stuff we have coming for you here on Breakthrough News. You can go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news, become a patron. There's a range of different things you will get, but most importantly, you'll be helping to push this work forward. Uh, the things that we all need, no need to get out there to a much greater degree. You can find us across all your social media platforms at BT Newsroom. So patreon.com slash breakthrough news if you want to support us and at BT Newsroom on social media, follow, share, ask questions, make comments. Uh, like I said, it's not just about us talking at you here. It's about a community as we always say on Breakthrough News. Don't just watch us, join us.